Hello, and welcome to Book Circle. I'm Earl Weyenberg. This time we will continue our reading of The Demon Priest by Jim Burroughs. Perspectives Telling her story took the girl more than four hours. The group broke once or twice to get drinks or dispose of them, but beyond that, the late afternoon into the early evening was devoted to the tale. During those hours, Lee and Lalela were transformed both in our eyes and in actuality. As she spoke, she not only told us of her experiences with Samuel, but showed us something of the troubled young woman that she'd become here in the mortal lands. The contrast with the angelic warrior woman sitting beside her was profound, even though Lalela, with shrugs of her shoulders, had retracted her wings and was no longer armed and armored. Still, her red skin, pointed ears, and stubby horns gave her a demonic appearance, all the more disquieting because her face and features were those of Lee. More than the physical, the two differed in their character and demeanor. Even sitting on the couch in our midst, there was no mistaking Lalela's power, presence, and self-assurance. Lee, sitting between Bella and Lalela, on the other hand, was very human, a timid, nervous, and damaged young woman. As the hours wore on, Lee looked all the more human, both physically and temperamentally. The horns were gone, her coloration completely human, her hands normal. Her confidence did seem to grow as the story progressed, but it wasn't the powered assurance of the fallen angel. No, she just seemed more human, to know that that was who she was, fragile perhaps, but entirely herself. Eventually, her story came around to the present, to the point where she had begun to tell it. So that's who we are, what we did, and how I learned where I came from, she said, turning to look at her other self. Someone, said Lalela, whom I never would have imagined that I could become. I suspect I know the answer, but how so? I asked. Well, first, I, or my human half, am hungry, she replied, but perhaps more in keeping with your thoughts, William, because as a celestial, angel, fallen angel, guardian, I never truly understood what it meant to be flesh. Maddie was the first to speak after that. You're right about the flesh needing sustenance, Lalela. Would it be all right, father, if I ordered food and we retired upstairs to eat? Chinese, said someone and someone else interjected, Thai, as long as it's food, declared a third. Call in an order to Mr. Takey Outie, and I'll pick it up, offered T.C. Deal, said Maddie, I'll come and pay. I'll come with you, offered Selina. That left Sam, Lee, Lalela, Bella, and me in the parish house. Lee suggested they make up the household comfort food to go with dinner, spiced pan bread with milk and honey. She and Sam started the well-practiced task. Lalela watched them for a bit, smiled, and joined in. I couldn't help but reflect how much it looked like a solemn ritual as they worked together in silence. Bella and I, by unspoken agreement, went about arranging the right number of chairs and place settings at the dining table. Even with both leaves out, the meal would be cozy, but that didn't look like it would be a problem. For all that the group comprised a number of incarnated fallen angels, humans, and metas, it was operating very much like a family, a family working toward the goals of opening a church and protecting a neighborhood. Once the food arrived and we were seated around the table and enjoying it, Bella asked, Lalela, do you represent all the other versions, aspects of yourself, yourselves? Represent? replied Lalela. In the sense that I am the only other incarnation, yes, but the only part, no. I'm afraid I'm not as up on my angelology as my grandfather and Uncle Samuel. This talk of parts and aspects is a little confusing. Lalela smiled, nearly a chuckle. Not only for you mortals. Incarnation, located in just one place, one flesh, We, or at least the two of us, she turned and nodded toward Lee, find it somewhat confusing as well. 
Perhaps now is the time to tell the story from another perspective. Please, and could you pass the Mama Chen's chicken? To start, I must ask how much you know of other realms. The Halflands, Dream, Fairy, the Garden, the Realm of the Bound. Are these known to you at all? asked Lulela. Not much, Bella replied. I know the Titania comes from Fairy, and the allies that she brought to aid humanity in the Demon Wars when I was very young were from realms that are near Fairy. I know that Poppy, Uncle Samuel, and their friend Walker have traveled to other realms, places with names like Dream and Twilight, and what Poppy has called the outskirts of Hell. A lot of people think he's nuts for claiming to have traveled there, but they also said he was nuts for claiming to have met you there. And people said pretty much the same thing about his grandfather and his talk of meeting Uncle Samuel in the Dream Realm. I've no idea how they'd explain us all sitting here eating Chinese food together. Maddie, Agent Jardin, let loose a large sigh at that point. You look like something is not setting with you well, Maddie, said Samuel. Is it the food or something that's been said? Well, Father, Bella touches on something that... Look, I'm speaking as Maddie here, not as Agent Jardin. You mustn't repeat it, agreed? Everyone gave her their assurances before she continued. Well, it's not exactly accidental that Bella and most of us don't know about other realms, the Halflands, and what lies beyond them. The emergence of superpowered metahumans, aliens, and time travelers has been unsettling enough to society that it is the position of Falcon, Unicorn, and most governments to de-emphasize the whole question of other realms. I mean, you can't completely deny they exist. Titania is a superhero and the Queen of Fairy, and she chased the Dark Prince to Earth through a portal over Great Meadow Park. The little green man is an alien, and he and the green team brought Earthling from the Lost World, and so on. But Dream, the Borderlands of Hell, Jinistan, they get all tied up in religion, myth, legend, prophecies, and such. People are still fighting wars over religious differences. So it's easier to just talk about demons and fairies as if they were just another form of metahuman and skip both the theology and the idea that there are other realms separated from ours by less than light years. So, no, most people don't know much about other realms. I'm sorry, Bishop. <clears throat> I see. Then perhaps I should start by telling you something of who Shamsio, I'm sorry, Father Samuel and I are. The priest and I are what have been called fallen angels. That's not completely accurate, although it might be the most common term. What we are is celestials, or perhaps spirits, beings for whom physical, material existence is not fundamental. The word angel means messenger, and while there are celestial messengers, that is not our role. Our function is not to carry messages into material realms. Our actions instead occurred entirely in celestial realms. But it is not surprising that those who call both men and women men might call us angels. The reason that I asked if you knew was that what I meant by other realms is similar. The word realm implies a place, and not all of what we call realms are physical places. Those with material senses who experience these realms will perceive them in terms of space, time, matter, and energy, because that's how their perceptions and conceptions work. Still, a non-physical realm is only loosely a place. It could just as correctly be called a state of being. When Shamsiel, as he was then known, first met the bishop's grandfather, it was in the realm of dream, where a part of him traveled when he was dreaming. Or you could say that they shared the same state of being in a way that brought their spirits together. It is easiest just to say that Reverend Whitcomb visited the dream realm in his dream body or form, and while there he met the fallen angel Shamsiel, who was also there in dream form, while another part of him remained in the realm of the bound, dreaming. Because that's easiest, that's how I will tell this part of our story. If that's acceptable, good. If we were not messenger angels, then what were our roles? We both resided in a realm best described as the Garden. 
a state of being in which the non-physical forms, the metaphysical forms of material beings, reside before and again briefly after their sojourn in the material realm, often called the mortal lands. Shamsiel was a watcher or guardian. His task was to observe and to be alert for anything that might interfere with or harm the mortals. The garden is a realm where the metaphysical forms of mortal beings prepare to become physical, and through which they pass as they leave the material realm. Since the realm is often known as the garden, my role can be said to have been the gardener. I nurtured, tended, and taught the emerging beings, and once their nature was seen, returned them to an unsullied state ready to become flesh. And when their material existence was complete, I would prepare them for the next realm beyond. Whim, the bishop, tells me that those whose faith centers on the same book as his have myths and legends about an angel called Layla that is very similar to my role. Mortal scholars call the role a psychopomp. I am, it might be said, an angel of conception and birth as well as an angel of death. The phrase fallen angel is used to describe different beings with quite different histories. It is most commonly associated with the celestials who revolted in the Great Rebellion. Celestials are not all of the same sort nor of the same order or power. The great powers have dominion over the lesser ones and are closer to the ultimate. The great powers assigned roles and domains to the lesser ones and worked to ensure that everything goes as it should according to the plan. Eons ago, many of the beings of the lesser orders rebelled against the celestial hierarchy and plan. This resulted in great celestial strife and conflict. Eventually, the rebels were bound in realms of their own, and all celestial and other metaphysical beings were forbidden in the mortal lands. The interdict is not unbreakable, but has been generally in place. One exception to that was the Watchers. Having seen the rebels throw off their roles and having spent eons watching material beings, a number of watchers decided to abandon their role and become flesh, taking on a physical aspect. Father Samuel described those events in one of his meetings that we heard of earlier. They were the sons of God who looked upon the daughters of man and begot the Nephilim, ancient heroes and godlings. They also echo... They also echoed some of my role from the garden, bringing knowledge to mortals sooner than they would have found it on their own. This caused a lot of trouble, as humanity's capabilities exceeded their ability to handle the responsibility. When they deserted the garden, I had to assume the role of guardian as well as gardener, wielding one of the tools, a weapon, what you know as the flaming sword, that they had left behind. And so I watched watched both the garden and the mortal realms. When I saw the chaos, strife, and destruction caused by premature knowledge and human lack of readiness, I too traveled to the material realm and, in conjunction with some of the more acceptable leaders, pruned weeds infesting the world. The higher powers held us both responsible and took us to task. The Watchers were confined to a bound realm, and I was set to watch the Watchers. Because the realm of the bound is a bounded, confined realm, it is more like material realms than the garden and the higher realms, so it was more of a place, and there were more places and approaches that it had to be watched from, and so I had to expand an aspect of myself that was already there in part, multiplicity. Those who are about to become flesh are already more constrained beings with fixed time and place, Dealing with them takes time and is localized. At first I could tend to many at a time, but as there were more and more being born, I had to become many, so that each of me could tend a number, and all of me could handle a very great many. So too with tending the boundary, guarding the realm. Whim saw some of this. To guard all approaches, I had to be many. Still there was only me. Celestials are simple beings, not complicated with all the mechanisms of flesh. Even if we can be many in many places to deal with many events, we do not have parts. When Samuel and William came to me, it caused me to do that which we do not easily do, change. 
what they said about free will, about the material realm. It caused me to reflect on what they said, and that one of them, a celestial, said much the same as the other, a mortal. And I became conflicted, you would say, of two minds. It was as if I had parts, and part of me conceived of things one way, and another a different way. This was very troublesome. Celestials don't have parts or conflicts, nuances or second thoughts. It is almost as if I was regaining the material aspect that I had had before, when I visited the material realm and pruned the weeds. It was only a small part of me that was behaving this way, and so the rest of me expelled that part, so that I could be simple and unified, as is the way of celestials. That material part became the one you know as Lee. The part, Lee, was just a fragment of what she once was, estranged from all that went before. She was not skilled at being flesh, and others, who had always been mortal, determined that she was broken. This is how she came to the safe place and the medicines. That's what you mortals do when someone is so profoundly estranged from themselves, or so I believe. Back on the boundary, it was difficult to forget her, the experience of having her as a part of me. My new role as guardian and watcher at the boundary, in part, led me to watching her in the mortal realm, and no matter what I wished, she had been a part of me, and the connection couldn't be eradicated. It was the same for her, but in a diminished way. Her mortal form perceived me as a voice, and then as voices. Strive as we might, we still had parts. We were becoming more than I, more than we, in the sense of one that was many. We were threatening to become many. When she confronted the Apollonian, the being that possessed the doctor, she was so small, so fleshly, so partial, that some of me, of us, wanted to aid her. By and large, I still wanted to be celestial, simple, one, undivided, without parts. And so I was torn, sundered. The changed parts manifested in the mortal lands, and with the powers of the psychopomp, I tore the alien spirit from the human body, and fully ma manifested to do that. I became the demon warrior woman that you saw fight the Apollonian. That is how we became Lee and the Lalela that you see before you. It is why it is hard for us to remain separate. It is why Lee has seemed broken. It was important for us to say this while we are still separate. We are becoming less estranged, more one. Chapter 12 Our Better Angels Bella and I got rooms for the night at the nearest hotel, in the Lyonnais, which might not have been the wisest choice, but the luxury was welcome, compared from St. Anthony's in the Pines. We were eating breakfast in the Lion's Head restaurant the next morning, when the whole place went dead silent for a second or two, and then buzzed with the soft sound of gossip. I turned to see what had instigated that, and got my answer immediately. Lionheart was striding straight for our table. "'Good morning, Miss Lockwood, Bishop Whitcomb,' he said, and waved a hand in a dismissive gesture. "'Don't get up.' I hadn't really considered it. But uh, this will just take a moment. I saw that you were staying with us. I trust everything is satisfactory. He didn't stop for me to assent, continuing, Will you be requiring anything special? Protective services, perhaps? I don't see that that seems likely, I replied when he paused. I see. I thought, well, with your demonic connections, church background, and the fact you chose to stay under my roof... It was the closest, and it was late, said Bella sharply. I see. So you are not expecting trouble to follow? Then I'm sorry to bother you. I hope you'll understand if we watch over you, just in case you're wrong. And with that, not waiting for a reply, he turned and strode out of the restaurant. Well, he's a real charmer, said Bella. But I imagine the viral video of him being batted half a block into that brownstone that they've been showing in the news is a little embarrassing for him. That was only our first encounter with him for the day. Not long after we arrived in the parish house and sat down with Lee and Samuel, there was a loud thump. 
we turned to look out the window, and he was striding our way from a small crater in the south lawn. I suppose we should see what he wants, said Samuel, getting up and leading the way to the cloister, with Lee, Bella, and me in tow. We met him at the steps down from the cloister to the south lawn. To what do we owe this visit, sir? Samuel asked Lionheart. I received a bill today from the owners of the building that your she-demon friend knocked me into. I came to find out how to contact her. Do demons even have addresses? Celestials, angels and demons, if you will, can have addresses just like anyone else if they take up bodily residence in mortal lands. You do understand that a physical manifestation isn't a necessity for us, though. I see celestials can be just as literal-minded as genies, so I'll try again. How do I contact the damn she-devil? And superheroes can be very rude, said Lee, stepping out, of a bit, stepping out a bit from behind Samuel. What do you want a damned she-devil for, anyway? Not that it's any of your business, sidekick, but she owes me for the damage to that building over there. Lee tilted her head as if trying to understand something extremely odd and gave a little chuckle. She owes for the damage. You interfere, assault her, and let the Apollonian escape, and somehow she becomes indebted? Is this what comes of worshipping the false god Mammon? What are you babbling about, child? Lionheart snapped. Lee gave a huge sigh and stepped back. As she did so, Lilayla, initially translucent but quickly solidifying, stepped forward from within her. I am saying, Lilayla hissed menacingly, that you are rude, arrogant, and impertinent, that you behave as a bully, and appear to be overwhelmed by greed and your self-importance. As she spoke, she grabbed his jacket at the base of his throat and lifted him off the ground. Do you know who I am? he spluttered. Nor do I care. Do you know who I am? I am the angel of conception, birth, and death. I guard the guardians. I have plucked mortals like weeds. With that, she gave him a shake, and he fell from her grip. Or his body did, leaving behind a translucent glowing figure of himself that she still held. The body looked stunned and vacant. The apparition looked terrified. I could toss away your spirit like the trash it is. Lee, Lalela, please put him back, Samuel said very softly, laying his hand on her elbow. Very well. She dropped the glowing figure back into, into place. Lionheart shuddered. Manners, Samuel observed, were created in part to limit conflict and allow for civil society. Tell that to her, Lionheart growled. In point of fact, it is something we could all do well to remember. Lilayla is new to incarnated life, and I am trying to teach her about the norms and mores here. Undue conflict only makes that job harder. The present atmosphere is not conducive to that effort, nor to any other negotiations for the moment, so perhaps you could depart my property." Gladly, snapped Lionheart and leapt into the sky. Once he was gone, Samuel healed the damage left by his landing and take off, giving Lalela time to calm down. And we'll follow the rest of their conversation next time.